Well, good morning, Fellowship Greenville. Uh, my name is Jim, and I am one of the pastors here. Thank you so much for being here to worship Jesus with us today. Hello, Auditorium 2 across the way. You guys look lovely per usual. Um, if you are new here, we're especially glad to have you. If you have any questions at all about life here at Fellowship Greenville, we invite you to stop by guest services in the commons over here in our Auditorium 1. We also have a little cool corner spot <clears throat> in the back right of Auditorium 2. We have a team in those places the, uh, that is ready to help you uh, with any questions you might have. And members and regulars, you know the drill. Please go say hey to the beautiful people out at Next Steps, also over here in the commons near Auditorium 1. Um, if you're looking to get further involved <clears throat> with what God is doing here, and like we've already mentioned, if you were here last week, I hope you sense that God is indeed faithful and present and doing things uh, in this family in this church that he's absolutely at work. Because of Jesus' cross and resurrection, God can't not be working. Um, I think personally, last weekend, one of my favorite things was everybody gathered in this room, <clears throat> tightly packed like sardines, last uh, Good Friday evening, and singing together was so, so beautiful, singing about the cross. Yes, it was. Uh, and um, beyond this, our team here, we have heard story after story of encouragement. I love hearing stories of people who have trusted Jesus for the very first time. Those stories absolutely never get old. And I know that that might include some of you. And if that is you, we want to continue to walk with you as you make your way into God's family and, and get used to life here. Uh, and a huge step in that process is baptism. And our next baptism will be on May 21st. We have a baptism class two Sundays before that on May 7th. And we would, again, love to walk with you through that. And if you have any questions about all of that, our team in the comments is happy to help. And you can also take out your phone and do the QR code right there on the chair back in front of you if you're looking for details on all of that. <clears throat> Additionally, if you are new with us, one of the things that you will find is that we try to be really, really committed to Holy Scripture. Most Sunday mornings, you will find us preaching and teaching straight through a long section of scripture or an entire book of the Bible. And right now we are in a series, as you saw a moment ago, called Royalty. And this version of our royalty series, we're tracing the life of Israel's very first king, Saul. And as we've seen, it's about way more than Saul. In a sense, the whole story of the Bible is about royalty. It's about a king and a kingdom. It's about how God wants us, people, humans, his image bearers to reflect and extend his loving reign out in the world. But the problem, however, is that we would often rather bow down to kingdoms of self or kingdoms of this world, and that is not the way that royalty is supposed to work in God's economy. So today, we get to keep thinking about these kinds of things in the life of King Saul in 1 Samuel chapter 15. So if you want to go ahead and get there in your Bibles, that would be good, great, wonderful, awesome, thank you. 1 Samuel chapter 15, and I promise we will get there in just a few minutes, 1 Samuel 15. Now, when we eventually get there, you will see that today's passage is largely about obedience, and so I want to kind of grease the tracks and start brainstorming in that direction. So just for a second, think with me. What comes into your mind when you think about obedience? What's the first thing that comes to mind when you think about obedience? Now, we could also do like good old word association or image association, like what's the first word or the first like picture that pops in your head when you hear the word obedience. Now, if I was guessing, I would say that most of us are probably thinking about obedience as it relates to parenting. Now, maybe you're thinking back to having to obey your parents, and even though you hated it way back then, you're now glad that they knew you weren't gonna marry your seventh grade crush, even though you swore at the time that they were your soulmate with your you know, perfect 12-year-old omniscience and stuff. So maybe you're grateful. Hey, thanks, Mom and Dad. Maybe it's like a, you know, a few decade uh, after the fact gratitude. Or maybe, maybe when you think about obedience, you think about in terms of actually being a parent. And all you want to do, and you don't feel like it's a lot, you're asking a lot, all you want to, to do is you want your kids to do what you ask <clears throat> when you ask. And in your mind, it's not that difficult. You're not a dictator. Like, <clears throat> it's not hard. You're not being a jerk. But you also know that they're kids. And sometimes you're like, are their ears even attached to their head? Like, what? <clears throat> like, I have to repeat it, you know, 
over and over again, obviously with lots of lots of grace, like for the 83rd time, flush the toilet, like something like that, or sweetheart, please, I've told you every day this month, take the clothes off the floor in your bedroom, please, please, dear God. Like maybe that's, <clears throat> obviously, you say those things with a lot of patience. But here, here's, here's what I've noticed about thinking about obedience <clears throat> and parenting. That obedience is not always as simple as we might think initially. Let me give you a, <clears throat> a little snapshot. <clears throat> if I tell my kids, hey, people are coming over tonight, so I need you to clean your rooms, and they both immediately and miraculously go, yes, sir, on it. If they do that, and then Sarah and I are both so busy doing other stuff that we just kind of look in their room and we see like an immaculate floor, we're like, whoa, nice, nice nicely done. <clears throat> However, what has actually happened is James and Anna Jubilee have made their bodies into like human bulldozers and just shoved everything up underneath their bed, which just is a classic move, it's nothing new. Um, <clears throat> but they do that, and I'm like, okay, that's how obedience is complicated because you, did you clean your room? Yeah, I mean, you're... Nobody's stepping on Legos, all right? So yeah. <clears throat> However, you also just reallocated the mess. So also, no. Or in the words of the Apostle Paul, they got the letter of the law, but not the spirit of the law. Um, <clears throat> now, when you're dealing with obedience, it, it continues to get messy in this way because you have to start to deal with motives behind obedience. And not just the motives of, like, let's say your kids, but also your own motives, like my motives as a parent. Like when I ask them to do something, <laughs> sometimes I'm wanting them to do the thing to like develop character and perseverance and going, hey, you gotta do what's right no matter what you feel. And sometimes I want them to do a thing because it's a nice way to show people care and thoughtfulness. And other times I want them to obey for their own protection and their own safety and, and well-being. But a lot of times they don't understand that, at least to the extent that I'm thinking about it. <clears throat> now here's what I'm convinced of. This issue of obedience extends way beyond parenting. It actually applies everywhere. <clears throat> Let me show you. If you're at work and your boss says to do X and you deliberately don't do X, you're in for it, right? If you go to your doctor and they're like, hey man, gluten and dairy is gonna wreck you something fierce and you're like, deal with it, Papa John's every night this week. Let me know how that goes for you. Now, if you are so brilliant enough to think that gravity doesn't apply to you and you try skydiving with no parachute, please let me know what obe disobedience tastes like. Please let me know. Or if you have a counselor or a therapist and they constantly remind you, hey, 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 only you can control only you. <clears throat> you can't control other people. And then you still try to break your back to coerce and manipulate and pressure people to do what you want. Your lack of obedience will suffocate those relationships. I'm telling you, it's everywhere. And if it's everywhere, then it's specifically and really importantly in how we think about our relationship with God. Now, <clears throat> when we think about our relationship with God and obedience, there's a lot of extra baggage right here because some of you grew up in a religious space <clears throat> that just constantly spouted rules on top of rules on top of rules and you were never allowed to ask any questions about any of the rules. And beyond that, your worth and your value in that religious space was solely tied to how much you obeyed the rules regardless of whether or not they were actually biblical. And I've heard enough stories <clears throat> from people in this church to know that some of you grew up under direct spiritual abuse. And that kind of stuff in my mind is demonic and I hate it and it breaks my heart. And so for you, <clears throat> any mention of obedience is, is met with resistance because of the way that you were raised. Now there are others of you <clears throat> who love the grace of God so much and you should. Like we're never gonna shut up about the grace of God, the grace upon grace upon grace that is ours in Jesus. However, <clears throat> some of you love the grace of God so much that along the way you've started to presume on the grace of God and now you actually use grace as an excuse to like duck and dodge obedience. Grace for you has become a license that lets you go on doing whatever you want and whatever you think is right and best. And then occasionally, you know, <clears throat> you'll mess it up, but then what you do is you over-spiritualize your disobedience in order to keep comfort and self as your primary idols. And that's almost as dark as the spiritual abuse stuff. Now, along these lines, <clears throat> Danish philosopher Soren Kierkegaard writes the following, here we go, this is great. 
The matter is quite simple. The Bible's really easy to understand, but we Christians are a bunch of scheming swindlers. We pretend to be unable to understand it because we know full well that the minute we understand, we're obliged to act accordingly. Take any words in the New Testament and forget everything except pledging yourself to act accordingly. My God, you will say, if I do that, my whole life will be ruined. How will I ever get on in the world? Herein lies the real place of Christian scholarship. Christian scholarship is the church's prodigious invention to defend itself against the Bible, to ensure that we can continue to be good little Christians without the Bible coming too close. Oh, priceless scholarship, what will we do without you? Dreadful it is to fall into the hands of the living God. Yeah, it's even dreadful to be alone with the New Testament. Now, that is haunting, <clears throat> but I think Kierkegaard is actually on to something. Just think about it. <clears throat> if you have your Bible open before you and you're trying to follow Jesus by following God's word, please get this. You don't get to do whatever you want to do with your body with whomever you want to do it and whenever you want to do it. You don't get to. You know why? The Bible clearly teaches your body doesn't belong to you. It belongs to God. It's his temple, 1 Corinthians 6. It's supposed to be a living sacrifice, Romans 12. Well, think about money. <clears throat> the Bible's also clear that if you belong to Jesus, your money isn't yours. You are just a steward. And you shouldn't be accruing stuff and trinkets and toys and gadgets, et cetera, to fill your bonus room and attic and garage. Rather, you need to be finding creative ways to give your stuff away, give your money away, give your time away, give your energy away, give your resources away to people in need. And guess what? Those aren't suggestions in the Bible like, if you got time. But somehow, here's the deal, <clears throat> whether it's our bodies or money or whatever, somehow we still find ways to presume on grace and to self-justify and then obey us rather than God. Or in the words of Kierkegaard, we Christians are a bunch of scheming swindlers. So <clears throat> what do we need to do about this? Again, the obedience thing is not as cute, tidy, simple, and black and white as we may have originally thought. And so this demands that we reconsider a biblical definition of obedience. So with scripture as our guide, we need to reimagine how obedience works, like how it acts and how it breathes rightly. So our question today is very simple. <clears throat> how does true obedience function? <clears throat> how does true obedience function? How does it operate? What all is involved? What are the mechanics of true obedience? Also, obedience is meant to be in the context of a relationship. You're not supposed to obey in a vacuum. So how can we honor God with obedience and not just feel better about ourselves? Moreover, <clears throat> if this whole thing is about royalty, then true obedience can't be a checklist. It's fundamentally about revering and reflecting God's loving reign in the world, which just makes our question even weightier. How does true obedience function? And today, 1 Samuel 15 is gonna help us out with our question. Go ahead and get there in your Bibles. And I've got fun news for us. We're gonna do the whole shabam. That's 35 verses. So just buckle up, friends. 35 verses. <clears throat> 1 Samuel chapter 15, verses one through 35. Also, just a heads up, um, there's some odd and intense stuff in this passage that we're not gonna get to talk about um, maybe at the length that you would like. But we also always want to posture ourselves before Holy Scripture with trust and gratitude, uh, even in the face of our questions. And so after I read the whole thing, <clears throat> all 35 verses, I get my line, which is, this is the word of God for the people of God, and then comes your line out loud together, thanks be to God, you too, auditorium too. Here we go, uh, uh, how does obedience function? First Samuel 15, start in verse one. And Samuel <clears throat> said to Saul, <clears throat> Yahweh, the special covenant name of God, it's usually capital L-O-R-D in your Bibles there. Yahweh sent me to anoint you king over his people Israel. Now therefore, listen to the words of Yahweh. <clears throat> Thus says Yahweh of hosts, I have noted what Amalek did to Israel in opposing them on the way when they came up out of Egypt. Now go and strike Amalek and devote to destruction all that they have. <clears throat> Do not spare them, but kill both man and woman, child and infant, ox and sheep, camel and donkey. So Saul went 
and summoned the people and numbered them in Telaim, 200,000 men on foot and 10,000 men of Judah. And Saul came to the city of Amalek and he lay in wait in the valley. And Saul said to the Kenites who were there, all right, you guys get out of here, go down from among the Amalekites, lest I destroy you with them. For you show kindness to all the people of Israel when they came out of Egypt. So the Kenites departed from among the Amalekites. <clears throat> and Saul defeated the Amalekites from Havilah as far as Shur, which is east of Egypt, you guys know. And then he took Agag, king of the Amalekites, alive and devoted to destruction all the people with the edge of the sword. But Saul and the people spared Agag and the best of the sheep and of the oxen and of the fattened calves and lambs and all that was good and would not utterly destroy them. And all that was despised and worthless, they devoted to destruction. Verse 10, verse 10. And the word of Yahweh came to Samuel I regret that I have made Saul king, for he has turned back from following me and has not performed my commandments. And Samuel was angry and he cried out to Yahweh all night. And Samuel rose early to meet Saul in the morning and it was told Samuel, Saul came to Carmel and behold, he set up a monument for himself, turned and passed on and went down to Gilgal. And Samuel came to Saul and Saul said to him, blessed be Blessed be you to Yahweh. I have totally performed the commandment of Yahweh. <clears throat> and Samuel said, what then is this bleeding of the sheep in my ears and the lowing of the oxen that I hear? And, Samuel said, or, and Saul said, they brought them from the Amalekites. For the people spared the best of the sheep and of the oxen to sacrifice to Yahweh your God. And the rest we have devoted to destruction. And then Samuel said to Saul, Dude, stop. I'm just going to tell you what Yahweh said to me last night. I was praying all night. Saul said, <clears throat> speak. And Samuel said, though you are little in your own eyes, are you not head of the tribes of Israel? Yahweh anointed you as king over Israel. He sent you on a mission. He said, go devote to destruction the sinners, the Amalekites, and fight against them until they're consumed. Why then did you not obey the voice of Yahweh? Why did you pounce on a spoil and do what was evil in the sight of Yahweh? And Saul said to Samuel, I have obeyed the voice of Yahweh. I went on the mission on which he sent me. I brought back Agag, king of Amalek, and I have devoted the Amalekites to destruction. But the, the people, yeah, the people took the spoil, the sheep and oxen, the best of the things devoted to destruction, you know, to sacrifice to Yahweh, your God, at Gilgal. Verse 22, and Samuel said, has Yahweh as great delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices, as in obeying the voice of Yahweh? Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice, and to listen is better than the fat of rams. For rebellion, that's like the sin of divination, and presumption is as iniquity and idolatry. Because you have rejected the word of Yahweh, he has also rejected you from being king. <clears throat> And Saul said to Samuel, I, I, I sinned, for I have transgressed the commandment of Yahweh and your words, because I feared the people and I obeyed their voice. Now therefore, please pardon my sin and return with me that I may bow before Yahweh. And Samuel said to Saul, I'm not gonna return with you, for you have, uh, for you have rejected the word of Yahweh and Yahweh has rejected you from being king over Israel. And as Samuel turned to go away, <clears throat> Saul seized the edge of his robe and tore it. And Samuel said to him, Yahweh has torn the kingdom of Israel from you this day and has given it to your neighbor who is better than you. Also, the glory of Israel will not lie or have regret, for he is not a man that he should have regret. And then Saul said, I have sinned, but just honor me before the elders of my people and before Israel and return with me that I may bow before Yahweh your God. So Samuel turned back after Saul and Saul bowed before Yahweh. Verse 32. And then Samuel said, bring me Agag, king of the Amalekites. And Agag came to him shakingly. And Agag said, surely the bitterness of death is past. And Samuel said, as your sword has made women childless, so shall your mother be childless among women. And Samuel hacked Agag to pieces before Yahweh and Gilgal. And then Samuel went to Ramah. And Saul went up to his house in Gibeah of Saul, and Samuel didn't see Saul again until the day of his death. But Samuel grieved over Saul, and Yahweh regretted that he made Saul king over Israel. And even though it's dense, this is the word of God for the people of God. All right, here's the game plan. 
We're gonna do three things that obedience doesn't include. We're gonna do two things that obedience must include. And then we're gonna do one foundation from which we should obey. Because if we're asking questions about what constitutes true obedience and how it works, in this passage, we can find those things. Three things that obedience doesn't include, two things that obedience must include, and one foundation from which we should obey. And to ease us into these, I want to address a couple of <clears throat> hurdles in this passage. Uh, first, uh, <clears throat> we're not hiding anything, the violence here. Um, for me, it's a lot, <clears throat> it's uncomfortable. Like whether you're going with the, the, the total destruction thing in verse three, or you're going with Agag's death in verse 33, this is so, so weighty. So a few things about this. <clears throat> First, the Amalekites were ancient Near Eastern land pirates. They just would go, they were like nomadic terrorists. They would just go and uh, rape and kill and pillage and steal and ravage other groups. And so <clears throat> there is a sense in which this is a kind of justice. And our lives today are often so sterile and sanitized that this still kind of makes us pick our shoulders up and wince just a little bit. It bothers us. But then you have the fact that God sanctions this somehow, which is another layer of, of fragility, no matter your theology. And furthermore, if you do go read other ancient Near Eastern literature, this is just how they wrote about militaristic stuff, about war. They just used language of utterly destroy and total destruction. That's just how you wrote about war back in the day. It was kind of an idiomatic way that you did it 3,000 years ago. And that might ease some of the heaviness of this, but still the violence in certain places in the Hebrew Bible can be very alarming. And we've preached other sermons about this. Charlie did a great one a couple summers ago, and we can send that to you if you guys have questions on email and stuff. Um, <clears throat> but if you do want to explore these ideas at greater length, I commend the following two books to you, The God I Don't Understand by Old Testament scholar <clears throat> Chris Wright. Excellent, excellent book. Additionally, The Skeletons in God's Closet by Pastor Josh Ryan Butler. Both of these works approach the questions of violence in the Bible <clears throat> with honesty and humility, and both are accessible and readable, and, and I think they, they push you to deeper faith in Jesus, even with a hard question on the plate there. So that, <clears throat> that's the, well, here's what I'm saying, that's the first hurdle, if you will, the violence thing. Now, there's one more <clears throat> hurdle, and that is that somebody, hey, somebody, if you read this passage, somebody might even be able to accuse God of being like wishy-washy or oblivious here. Look at verse 11, look at verse 11. I regret that I made Saul king. Not a good look, Lord. Now look down at verse 35. <clears throat> look, and Yahweh regretted that he made Saul king. What in the Moses? What does that mean? I can see up there going, dadgummit. Like, I, <clears throat> now, here's the deal. Sometimes in the Bible you have things on the end and then there's something in the middle that kind of echoes the thing on the end that helps explain everything. Look at verse 29. Tucked in the middle of these things, there's another little regret picture. This is about Yahweh. The glory of Israel does not lie or have regret. He doesn't. He's not a person. He's not a man. We regret. We're wishy-washy. But Yahweh doesn't do that. Uh, question? Right? <clears throat> Doesn't that feel a little odd? <clears throat> now, this word regret in verses 11, 29, and 35 is the Hebrew word nacham. It's a word about God's emotional presence and involvement and engagement with his people. Meaning, here's what it means. <clears throat> God feels the ache of Saul's disobedience. However, look at 29. He's not caught off guard. He's not like, whoa, he's not surprised. He's still the unregretting sovereign one if you look at the verse, verse 29. We're the wishy-washy and fickle ones, and he's not like us at all. Now, I know that might be difficult, and some theologians labor hard to, to use language to talk about this. They say things like this, and I think this is helpful. God is unchanging in his being and his attributes, in his perfections and in his purposes. However, God also engages with and responds to his world, and he engages and responds differently in response to different circumstances. Now, that might help some of you. Some of you might still have questions. That's okay, um, because this is taking us to our first big point. There are three things that obedience doesn't include, and the first one is that you don't have to understand everything before you obey, <clears throat> right? 
whether it's the violence thing or the regret thing, if you have questions about that, that's fine. You don't have to grasp it all before you obey. So here's the first one. <clears throat> Complete understanding isn't a prerequisite for true obedience. Complete understanding isn't a prerequisite for true obedience. And depending on your personality, that might either like set you free or bother you. But I'm just telling you that that's the case. And as readers of this text, <clears throat> we don't have to dot all our I's and cross all our T's before we trust God and act. We have to learn from Saul's mistake here. But so many of us think <clears throat> that we can hold God captive until he explains himself and after he explains everything to us in a way that we can totally understand on the first take, and he better not repeat himself, when he can explain himself clearly, then we'll do what he asks. And that's how we operate sometimes. We think we can hold God captive. And guess what? Isaiah 55, his ways are above our ways. You're never fully gonna understand it. And guess what else? Your eight-year-old might be smart, but they can't fully understand that behind the obedience you're asking for lies layers of motives about protection and character development and perseverance. So how much more is this going to be the case with our good and heavenly father, right? In fact, <clears throat> this is scary. When you lack understanding might be the time that you most need to step out in faith and obey when you can't quite put the pieces together and your brow is still furrowed and you're like, but God, I don't under, that might be the time where you get up off your butt in Jesus' name and go, I'm gonna do it anyway, Lord. I'm gonna do it. I'm gonna obey, even though I don't totally get it. And again, I'm not saying the hurdles in this passage are easy and I'm not saying the hurdles in your life are easy. Here's what I'm saying. Please get it. Yo, there's always gonna be hurdles. But I'm also saying God will always be good and sovereign and near to us in the middle of them. And it is, it's a fool's errand to demand complete understanding before we obey. That's what I'm saying. All right, <clears throat> that's the first one. We're doing three things that obedience doesn't include. That's the first one. And the second one is blaming others isn't a part of true obedience. <clears throat> blaming others isn't a part of true obedience. And let me show you uh, where I get this. Uh, yes, this passage has some confusing stuff, but I also think, and I hope you're excited about this, <clears throat> that this is one of the funniest scenes in the whole Bible. Please use your imagination. Look at verse 13. <clears throat> verse 13, Samuel approaches Saul, but Saul says to Samuel, think about that. If somebody walks up to you, you lift your brow and you go, like, what are you gonna say? But Samuel approaches Saul and Saul goes, hey man, what's up? Like he's trying to control the narrative. So Saul starts with, hey, but, Bless God, Brother Samuel, have you lost weight? I totally obeyed, which that, <clears throat> that in itself is hysterical. He's supposed to get rid of all the sheep and all the cows. And so <clears throat> verse 13, this is what happens. Samuel walks to Saul. Saul says, bless God, Brother Samuel, I just obeyed so hard. Bah! That's, <laughs> that's exactly, and Saul's like, Phew! he kicks a sheep. Like, that's what he does. This is, this is exactly what happens. Look at the next verse. Look, I, I wish I could have seen Samuel's face. Look at verse 14. He goes, what then is this bleeding of the sheep that I hear, right? He's like, bro, stop. Like, this is a hysterical scene. And then look at what, look at what Saul does in verse 15. <clears throat> Follow the pronouns. Saul says in verse 15, they have brought them from the Amalekites to sacrifice to Yahweh, your God. And in psychology, that's called distancing language. When he's caught red-handed, <clears throat> Saul puts it on other people. And that's why blaming other people can't be a part of true obedience. Because when you blame somebody, what you're doing is you're trying to duck and dodge responsibility. But blame over-promises and under-delivers. It thinks, it makes you think that you're gonna get away scot-free. But I tell you right now, blame cannot lead you to life change. Like if you want happiness or peace in your life, it can't happen while blame is in your heart and in your mouth. It can't. And if you want to move forward in your relationship with God in faithfulness and obedience, it will not happen when blame is filling your soul, mind, and mouth. It's not a possibility. In terms of responding to God, faithfulness is health and strength, but blame is like an undiagnosed cancer that will undo you from the inside. And here you guys get to be my <clears throat> like collective confession booth for a second. I think this is the biggest sin that I struggle with. Like, 
I don't, you can ask my, my wife and kids, like, I'm not an angry dude. I, I don't really get impatient. Even in traffic, I'm like, nice move, seriously. Like, I'm not greedy, really. But if I can find things or people to blame that explain why stuff is wrong, this is what I do. I slowly start to justify myself, and then I believe that I don't need the justification provided for me by Jesus at the cross. And if I don't put a check on blame in my heart, I can start to think that I know better than God, and that's the stupidest thing a human can do. And way more often than I'm willing to admit, I have a blame disease with Saul here. And so blame can't be a part of true obedience. All right, next, and really briefly, partial obedience is actually disobedience. Partial obedience is actually disobedience. Verse 19, look at verse 19. Samuel says, why then did you not obey the voice of Yahweh? Verse 20, Saul said, I did obey the voice of Yahweh. Now notice, in Saul's heart, Blame is making him reinterpret reality. He can't see what's actually true because he's blaming people. And that's terrifying. Like he actually did 95% of the job we devoted to destruction, blah, blah, blah. And that's, that's close enough, right? Like the floor is clean. It's all under the bed. That's, that's good, right? Like that's enough. But not only does blame convince us into self-justification, but percentage obedience does the exact same thing. We do enough to feel good about ourselves and then we just kind of carry on. And Samuel says that's actually disobedience. From chapter 13, a few weeks ago, Charlie said the following. Do you ever find yourself ignoring what God clearly says and simultaneously asking God for help? And chapter 15's version of that is this. Do you ever find yourself obeying part of what God clearly says and then simultaneously thinking you're helping God out? That's a scary place to be. Again, partial obedience is actually disobedience. <clears throat> All right, that's three things that obedience doesn't include. Now let's do two things that obedience must include. Now look, the first one here, look at verse <clears throat> 22. It's, it's a few times, it's mentioned a few times. Look at verse 22. <clears throat> Has Yahweh as much delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as in obeying his voice? <clears throat> so here it is. Biblical obedience begins with hearing the voice of the Lord. Biblical obedience, true, right, real, faithful, biblical obedience begins with hearing the voice of the Lord. And this is the first thing, the first step of true obedience. Now, because I grew up Baptist, the language of the voice of, of, the, voice of the Lord kind of stuff, it used to make me kind of nervous. But this passage right here, this is about what God has clearly revealed and said and spoken. And hearing God's voice is not about getting an, an audible call from him every Sunday. That's not the deal. <clears throat> it's about listening to his voice in creation, in other godly people, in corporate worship, in art, in solitude, and in prayer. And ultimately, it's about hearing and knowing God's voice as he speaks to us in Holy Scripture. In his word, he has spoken to us with crystal clarity. So much so that the pinnacle of the written word of God is the incarnate word of God, Jesus himself, who has come to rescue us. He he is God's voice with skin on. John says he's the word made flesh. And when we pay close attention to Jesus, we hear God's voice with absolutely zero static. Now, this is fun back in 1 Samuel. The Hebrew word for obey in 1 Samuel 15 is the word shema, which is also the word for hear, like what your kids don't do when you ask them to do something. It's the first word in the morning and evening prayer of every single Jew from Deuteronomy 6. Shema Yisrael, hear O Israel, Yahweh, your God, he is the one. And that word, Shema, is used eight times in this passage. In fact, look at verse one. It's the first line in the text. Look at verse one, the last line of it. Now, therefore, listen, hear, heed, obey, Shema, listen to the words of Yahweh. And then that same word is used in verse 19, 20, and 22, and it's translated, obey the voice of the Lord. Meaning, obeying begins with hearing. 
But there's also, <clears throat> right underneath this, like there's, there's a sub point tucked underneath this if you look in verse 24. Look at verse 24. Samuel said, <clears throat> excuse me, Saul said to Samuel, I have sinned for I have transgressed the commandment of Yahweh and your words because, look, I feared the people and I obeyed their voice. And that means that hearing God's voice will quite often mean plugging your ears to the, voice, to the voices of others. Now, please hear me, <clears throat> pun intended. I'm not talking about being a good listener to people in your life. Not what I'm talking about. <clears throat> I'm not talking about how God can speak through other people. It's not what we're talking about. I'm talking about Saul's problem here. He had a people-pleasing idolatry problem, and he just wanted to make everybody feel happy, make everybody love him, make everybody be okay. He just wanted to please everybody all the time. And so other people's voice, voices took preeminence over God's. However, it is God's voice and God's word and his truth and his standards that should govern our lives. <clears throat> what God says is most important. And not breaking our backs to win some completely lame popular opinion poll comprised of people just like us. That's the dumbest thing ever. Obedience does not start with me. doesn't start with you. doesn't start with other people. Obedience starts with God. And if you look at Saul here and you go, dude, just get your stuff together, just obey. Think back again, how hard it is for your kids just to hear you sometimes. And that's why you have to repeat it. And now think about how gracious and patient our good and heavenly father is. And that should make you take a deep breath and it should remind you that obedience begins with hearing his voice. Now, <clears throat> closely related to this, the second point here, this is like sequel to the first point, is, is this. True obedience <clears throat> moves from a listening, trusting heart to faithful, sacrificial action. True obedience moves from a listening, trusting heart to faithful, sacrificial <clears throat> action. And each piece of this matters. This is worded in a very specific way. True obedience moves from a listening, trusting heart to faithful, sacrificial action. And here's where I get this. Look at verse 22. Verse 22, Samuel is actually doing a nice pastor move here, Pastor Samuel. He's asking a trick question. Look, Saul, does Yahweh have greater delight in offerings and sacrifices or in obedience? This is the curveball. <clears throat> to sacrifice to God in the Old Testament was to obey him. So the answer is yeah, but, but, but <clears throat> Saul's sacrifices were not made from a hearing, listening, and trusting heart, so they weren't real obedience after all. Samuel knows that true obedience is gonna cost you something and that there will be sacrifice involved, but it has to be, quote unquote, faithful, meaning it has to be consistent with a heart that is trusting the Lord and hears what he's asking. This is not just cleaning the floor. It's not just cleaning under the bed. It's knowing that your father asked you to do so for good purposes and you obey him because you love him and not to avoid any possible frustration of his. The kind of obedience that the Bible invites us into is not demanding, threatening legalism. Because it's supposed to begin with listening and trusting, it can be what French philosopher Simone Weil called the infinite sweetness of obedience, which I love. And unlike Saul, there can actually be a glorious beauty to obedience if it begins with a hearing heart and if it begins with faith. And that's the thing that scripture invites us into and it's an invitation into intimacy with God and his people and his purposes. Now, <clears throat> before I get to my last, last point, I mean, we're flying through this stuff and this is a lot, <clears throat> so I wanna pause for about a minute and just do like, Take a deep breath and do some soul renovation. I have some just questions for you. Don't write these down. They're in the app, the notes and the stuff. If you wanna look at them later. <clears throat> but we have to process this. We're drinking from the fire hose. We just to, I wanna breathe for a second. The Holy Spirit, do something. <clears throat> Where in your life are you demanding that God explain himself before you believe him or obey him? Where in your life are you living in a place of blame towards another individual? And maybe you're, you have people pleasing disease like Saul, so maybe you don't like speak that blame to others, but <clears throat> maybe you blame God. So where in your life are your fists clenched at God? Where are you blaming him?
Where do you know that you have only partially obeyed? And you know that. You know there's more steps to take and you aren't taking them. How are you doing with listening to God's voice? Listening to him speak from his word. Is that a regular part of your life? Hey friends, is there any way at all in which other people's voices are above God's in your heart and mind? And what are your heart's motives when you seek to obey God? Is it so that other people are gonna see you or so that you can think he owes you one? Or do you actually trust him and love him? Like, What are your motives when you obey him? These are the kinds of things that we have to be thinking about if we're doing 1 Samuel 15 correctly. So we did three things obedience doesn't include, two things it must include. And finally, for just a minute here, one foundation from which we should obey. <laughs> one foundation from which we should obey. So in our passage, is the end of the road for old Saul. <clears throat> He's rejected as king in his fi- final days uh, in kingship that we'll look at in the next month or so. His final days of kingship are spent actually trying to take other people down with him. It's an embarrassing uh, story. <clears throat> but this passage simultaneously reminds us that we botch it just like Saul and that we need a king from God who won't, who's not like Saul. Enter King Jesus. And if royalty is the point of the whole story, and obedience is like an engine for the kingdom of God coming from heaven to earth, then Jesus is the king who obeys his father perfectly, and then he becomes the rock on which we stand. Here it is, here's the last, the last thing here. Jesus' obedience is not only our supreme example, but also the sure foundation from which we obey. We obey because we have been perfectly loved at the cross and in the resurrection. We've been perfectly loved. For God so loved the world that he gave Jesus. And we don't obey in order to be perfectly loved. And I'm fully convinced, brothers and sisters, that if you get this, it will set you free. One more time. Jesus' obedience is not only our supreme example, but also the sure foundation from which we obey. We obey because we have been perfectly loved and not in order to be perfectly loved. Listen to the New Testament, Shema. Hebrews 5 says that even though Jesus was a son, he learned obedience through the things that he suffered and he became the source of eternal salvation for everyone who obeys him. Romans chapter five says that through Adam's disobedience, royalty unraveled, but now we got a second Adam, Jesus, who through his obedience, he can now forgive us and heal us and declare us righteous before the Father. Philippians two says that Jesus became obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross, meaning his obedience cost him something. It was sacrificial, self-giving love, and in it, he loved us perfectly. Like on, on my own, I can't live up to God's standards. Left to myself, I sin and fall way short. Like I'm Saul, you're Saul, we're all Saul if we try to do it on our own. And if it's up to me, I'm deserving of, of judgment and separation from God. But King Jesus stepped in and he obeyed in my place. He obeyed in your place all the way to the cross, taking the death that should be ours. And he heard and heeded his father flawlessly. And if we believe him, his faithfulness, this is unreal, his faithfulness can be counted as ours. And now obedience is not a chore, trying to get God's attention to love us and bless us because he has unconditionally loved us in Christ and in him we have every spiritual blessing according to Ephesians 1 and now we obey as a response to God's love and not in order to bend God's love to bend God's arm to love us that's why we obey and now because of that obedience is actually freedom And now obedience is about experiencing God's love and presence. It's about knowing that he has called us to be ambassadors of his kingdom wherever he has placed us. That's the royalty that we are made for and we can only taste it because of Jesus. Not your efforts, not your ability to follow through, not your accomplishments, 
But Jesus, he is the one sure rock solid foundation on which we stand and all other ground is sinking sand. Fellowship Greenville, I got really good news for you this morning. The tomb is still empty and King Jesus still reigns and because of what he has done, he beckons us into a life of faithfulness and obedience to him and I hope that sounds infinitely sweet to you. Let's pray together. Holy Spirit, we, we beg of you, be the wind at our backs and launch us forward in fidelity and obedience. Make our lives to look like Jesus and make us to live in the wake of his perfect obedience. Please, Holy Spirit. And Jesus, we thank you and we praise you and we love you and we adore you and we worship you for your obedience all the way to the cross to be our perfect representative. And we could never thank you enough and we will never tire of praising you for it. Jesus, we love you. You're the best. Amen.